about the patents in the submarine. Oh, the patents. Oh, yeah, the patents. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I'll tell you that story. Uh, just after the war, I went back home. And I was at Cornell University. And I'd come back home to visit and so forth. It wasn't more than, I can't tell you whether it was three months or six months, but it's that period of about that time I happened to be home, and I got a telephone call long distance from California. Now, this for me was unusual. Nowadays, is nothing, but that was something, a long distance call from this marvelous place of California for a million miles away, you know? Something very important was always a long distance call in those days. You have to picture the situation. He had the call, and I answered the telephone. Hello, is this Professor Feynman? I said, yeah. I says, I am. That's who I am. He said, well, this is such and such and so airplane company. One of the big airplane companies in California. Unfortunately, I can't remember which one. Big company in California. And he said, now what we're planning to do, he said, is to open up a laboratory. We're starting a laboratory on nuclear-propelled rocket airplanes. And uh, we expect to have two so-and-so much dollars, big numbers, to operate the laboratory. There will be so-and-so many people. I said, just a moment. I said, you're telling me all this? I don't know why. He says, just let me speak to you. Just let me tell you, sir. <laughs> just let me do it my way. I said, all right. So it goes a little long. Hey, how many people are going to be in the laboratory? The different layers of echelons, there'll be guys working on the so-and-so, so-and-so many people at this level, so-and-so many technical people at this level, so-and-so many PhDs, so-and-so many. He's telling me all this stuff about the future laboratory. of the. I said, excuse me, but I think you have the wrong fellow. He says, am I talking to Richard Feynman, Richard P. Feynman? I said, that's right. I said, but you're talking. He says, would you please let me present what I have to say, sir, and then we'll discuss it. I said, all right. I sit down and I sort of close you, my you head and I listen to all that stuff, <laughs> all that stuff, and I don't know why he's giving me all this information. I haven't the slightest idea, and it's very detailed. It's very detailed information. So I said, well, why do you tell me all this? I he says, because, he says, I'd like to know if you would like to be the director of this laboratory. So I says, have you got the right fella? I said, I'm a professor of theoretical physics. I'm not a rocket engineer, an airplane engineer, or anything like this. So he says, yes, he says, I'm sure we have the right feather. I said, well, where did you get my name? He says, sir, your name is on the patent for rocket-propelled airplanes. Oh, I said, <laughs> and it was true. And I realized why my name was on the patent for rocket-propelled airplanes. And I have to tell you the story. Of course, I immediately gave the job up. But of course, I wanted to continue as a professor and not become the chief of this wonderful million dollars laboratory. But what happened was that during the war, there's a fellow who was Captain, oh, gee, I wonder, Captain Smith, yeah, was in charge of the patent department for the government. And he had sent around a notice saying, we in the patent office would like to patent every idea that you have so as to be covered for the United States government for who we're working now. And any idea that you are discussing, you think everybody knows about, Everybody doesn't know about it. any kind of idea or application of this nuclear energy and so don't forth and so on. Yeah. Don't take it for granted, yeah, that everybody knows about it. Just come in the office and tell me the idea. So I see this fellow at lunch, and when we walk back to the technical area, I said, listen, I did that note that you sent him. Well, that's kind of crazy to talk about every idea. There's so many ideas that you could have. There's so many. I'm in his office now. There's so many ideas that are perfectly obvious that I'd be here all day giving ideas. He says, like what? Well, I says, nothing to it. I says, for example, you have nuclear reactor underwater. Water comes in, steam goes out the other side, goes along at the submarine. Nuclear reactor, air comes rushing in the front, heated up by the nuclear reaction, out the back, boom, through the air. Or you could have a rocket. You got a tank of hydrogen, goes through the heat, zoom, power plant. Only instead of using ordinary uranium, use enriched uranium with beryllium oxide at high temperature. I says, a million of them, and I slam the door going out. <laughs> so nothing happened. Three months later, he calls me in the office. He says, the uh, submarine has already been taken. <laughs> but the rocket-propelled airplane and the uh, enriched uranium, he says, is yours. <laughs> I think I got three patents. I don't know what they are anymore. Three patents have my name on it. And all I did was... One yeah, time in the office. One time in the office, I just mentioned all these obvious things. Well, what happened was that uh, when these guys are working out this laboratory and they're trying to find out who's an expert in rocket propelled <laughs> one nuts, <laughs> well, it's nothing to it. They look at the patent. Who's got the patent on it? 
I got the patent on it, <laughs> <laughs> what not? And so there's my opportunity to be the head of this laboratory in California. But I remember something else to tell you about that patent business, okay? When you give the patent to the government, you have to sign a document that you give them the patent. And a legal document is not a legal document unless there's some exchange. And so they say for the sum of one dollar, you give this to the government, hmm. okay? There's some dopey legal thing. So you gave the patent for one dollar. And so I said to the guy in the office, I said, where's my dollar? <laughs> so he says, well, that's just formal. I just the signing. I said, look, it's a real document and I, it's legal. And you made me sign. You know, I'm always like a fool around. I said, if you really say, if I sign a thing saying I got a dollar, I've got to get a dollar because I'm a straight and honest man and there is no fooling around about it. He said, oh, he says, this is silly. He says, we haven't got any funds set up to give a dollar. I said, well, that doesn't make any difference. You got it all set up that I'm signing for the dollar. You know what I mean, and so forth. So I kept arguing back and forth. He said, all right, he says, I'll give you a dollar from my pocket. He said, okay. So I take his dollar, and I realize what I'm going to do. So I go down to the grocery store, and I buy a dollar's worth, which is pretty good then, of those chocolate cookies with marshmallow inside and a whole lot of goodies. Okay, and I come back into the theoretical laboratory, and I give them out. I have a prize. I have a prize. A dollar. I got a dollar for my patent. I got a dollar for my patent. I give it to everybody. Result. Everybody who has one of these patents, because it was easy. A lot of people had been sending things in. Lots of patents. Everybody come down, they want their dollar. <laughs> He starts shelling them out of his pocket. Then he realizes it's going to be a hemorrhage. It's going to be that. And he got crazy trying to set up somewhere a fund where he could get the lousy dollars that these guys were insisting on. I don't know how he finally settled up, but that was my usual mischief.